Well, hello everyone, and welcome to our first edition of Gamification and Mixed Reality. This is a podcast series produced by the Centre for Teaching and Learning at Humber College here in Toronto, Ontario. Rexdale, Ontario. We're a little north of the city here. What we're going to be doing in this podcast over the next uh, 10 sessions is introducing you to the world of virtual reality, augmented reality, and gamification as they apply to the educational context. We're going to spend the first few podcasts giving you some background on the field, understanding who developed this field called gamification, understanding some of the technology behind virtual reality and its use in classroom, and the development of what we call integrated virtual learning environments, or VLEs, ways in which we confuse augmented reality, hyper-reality, virtual reality, what we would call mixed reality, together to support learning. So without much further ado, let's start taking you through some of the fundamentals. Our objective today is to get you looking at the idea of gamification and thinking a little bit about how it might be helpful in your own teaching. There's a gentleman here I'd like you to meet, Herman Ebbinghaus. Now, Herman Ebbinghaus in uh, 1855 produced some of the best work on learning and memory that uh, we've seen in the field. And he began to experiment on himself. It was interesting. Ebbinghaus was a philosopher. And at that time, they felt that memory occurred in some kind of space that was almost a philosophical mind space. They didn't understand much about um, traditional physiology. The, the whole field was just developing. People like William Fechner. Uh, influenced Ebbinghaus very strongly. So he was a student of people such as Immanuel Kant. What Ebbinghaus did in, in his ingenious experiments is he began to recite uh, words to himself. And he found out that reciting lists of words to see how long he could remember them for was problematic because all of these words had a meaning. So he invented these consonant syllables, words like clob and dot and flub, which didn't mean anything. And he would simply repeat a list to himself and he would measure 10 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, and on throughout the day to to see how long it was before he learned, uh, forgot different segments uh, and different uh, elements of his memory task. So this produced something that's kind of famous in higher education now, and should be, it's the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. And what this shows you folks here is that you'll see plotted on the uh, left-hand side of the screen is the retention rate. Just move back to the slide. And that we also have uh, on the bottom screen, uh, part of the screen, the time elapsed learning. So you can see that Ebbinghaus found that he did some experiments. We had up to 15,000 items that he had himself remember. Really amazing stuff. So uh, with immediately, you could, he could remember almost 100% of a list of nonsense syllables. 20 minutes later, he was down to about 58% recall. One hour, he was at 44. And as you can see, this linear negative regression, within uh, something like 31 days, he was down to 21% of the content. So Ebbinghaus's uh, work is significant for us because it gives us an idea of what we call a forgetting curve. And this is the idea that when you first learn something, if your students don't review it almost immediately, the extinction becomes really strong, and then you're into exam cramming, etc. And we're going to have some undesirable learning account outcomes. So the first thing we want to focus on today is how do we get students to engage with material in something a little more directed and satisfying for them than simply reading their notes a couple of times with friends afterwards. Because these curves seem to operate independent of those, those, uh, those interventions. So you can look at your notes once, but as you can see here on the curve, if we get subsequent review, we can boost it up to almost 100% for decay. Well, how do you get your student to do this one and two and three days after the learning? So begin to think about this problem as we kind of move forward with the presentation, and we're going to take it piece by piece. If we want to talk about the idea of gamification first before we get into VR, this is the idea of simulation and engagement. So think of having the students do something like they would on a little smartphone app like this, where they have to see a patient in virtual space, and something which really gives them a high level of engagement. This is the number two top-ranked gamification guru in the world, Andres Marzowski, who does a lot of work with a company called Motivate in the UK, where they use gamification strategies to help in Fortune 500 type companies. So we would then define gamification as motivational design. That is the use of game elements and game mechanics in an ungame context. The idea here is that we've learned a lot from the video game industry and related uh, entertainment industry about how to really hook people. And if we can hook students and engage them using some of these tactics, we're going to have a better quality experience and fight that Ebbinghaus curve. 
<clears throat> there has been an educational innovation timeline that we've seen since the 1960s, and the three big majors have been problem-based learning, developed by McMaster uh, University Medical Center, now used by Harvard Medical School and the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands, where they do really cutting-edge work, where essentially there are no lectures in medical school. You would start seeing virtual patients from the first day of school, and you would scaffold your learning on that patient encounter through pattern recognition and develop embedding your learning objectives in, in inquiry. Simulation-based learning Learning, based learning became very strong and is still practiced through SIM1. SIM1 is an organization of something in the area of 90 different centers. All the major colleges and universities are part of it. These are professional simulators where we try to take you into the real world as a student and try to use that simulation. Game-based learning emerges about 2000 to 2001 and is given a lot of uh, credibility by the work of David Kaufman at Simon Fraser University where I was a part of a five-year uh, SAGE grant, a simulation advanced gaming environment study where we invo involve 14 different institutions and we looked at the science underlying gamification. Here is some of the work that we've been doing in conjunction with Ryerson University over the past few years. We've produced something in the area of 30 to 40 monographs or presentations in this area. And you can see this runs the full gamut of studies on the use of gamification. Uh, this was a study in which we used it in family health nursing um, to look at gamifying a nursing course. Here we were looked at learning management systems to see if we can uh, develop them and you can build a lot of games on LMSs. And then we did a lot of work in the area uh, such as uh, health professions education and we did a lot of work in multimedia as well. Some of our other research um, answers into the air, and we'll get back to this in frame game learning in the use of seniors. Can we connect seniors through, uh, through gamified learning? And it turns out we can. We get some great results. SOS is a game-based simulation app that we've developed with Baycrest Center, uh, Baycrest Health Sciences. This is the premier research center uh, for the work in geriatrics and also the location of the Cognitive Neuroscience Program at University of Toronto. And we've built a fairly strong game that's seen about 10,000 plays so far. We'll get back to that later in the course for teaching geriatrics pediatric uh, caregiving uh, and especially the, uh, the um, <coughs> value of instant feedback and analysis to learners. And as you can see, this is kind of an interesting project we did with the uh, College of Family Physicians and Surgeons using gamification for the management of addiction in adolescence under the Daniel, Daniel Glazer grant. So we've got a lot of great work going on. Some hot stuff going on in gamification research is still going on in the work of David Kaufman and Louis Save. This is the gamification and uh, the grant, but they are part of what's called the Age Well Work Group 4.2, in which they're studying the use of gamification to increase social connectedness in seniors. So there is a vibrant research community in gamification, and we want to try to take you into this material a little bit. To sort of round off our presentation for today, that you sort of understand the problem, we want to get students engaged with their learning so they expose themselves to content more, so we have to do a little less work as in instructors and sort of uh, in getting students excited about learning, where we produce a system that gets students engaged and motivated so we don't have to be at their back all the time encouraging them. Their ga so game systems can be produced in which we have users, that is students, stay longer. And In other words, we've had uh, work at Ryerson University we've done over the past uh, 20 years where we've shown that uh, students will actually stay after class and beg for more quiz questions. If the quiz questions are used as a kind of currency in the game to help them advance when they're competing with other groups. We also know that people will come back more often to gamified environments. They're going to find it engaging. Imagine your students, while waiting for a bus, get on their mobile device and play a game that reinforced what you taught that day. And then, of course, it can generate more revenue. This is where we use gamification to monetize in the business world. And that is not a the great concern for us. Um, gamification versus game-based learning. And gamification, as we can see looking at this list, is the idea of using game ideas uh, to advance business. Imagine a roll up the rim at Tim Hortons or imagine Shoppers Drug Mart loyalty points. Game-based learning is where we take these game elements and we focus on motivating students and trying to produce challenges for learning. So game-based learning, GBL, is the area you want to focus on here. We can see that there's many different rewards you can provide to students for engaging in game-based learning. You can give them points, that is, you can have them do assignments in class, and those assignments are worth points. Think about a, a, a class where you teach a lot of interesting content, but the student is not quite sure of what's important and what's not. And we're going to get back to that in our next podcast. But for now, let's understand that by assigning points to activities in the class, by having the student achieve different levels, to say I'm a level one, I'm a level two, I'm a level three learner, they can then mark their own achievement and say, look at what I've learned today, and look at what I can reflect on in my learning.
By the use of giving badges, some sort of um, reward for the learner to say, you know, you well done or you've achieved something. Again, this idea of having the learner be able to benchmark their own progress in something other than quizzes and assignments and grades. Because remember, these are tentatively punitive exercises. If you screw up in quizzes and exams, you could be out of the program or held back a year or even worse. But if you have a game element where you can have a psychologically safe environment for learning, we can use badges, levels, and points, what's called points badge leaderboards, to, to move people ahead. You can also, in more advanced game systems that we're working on developing, use virtual goods so you can buy things in the game. We have a colleague, Deborah Fells, who's a professor of, she's an engineer and a professor of business at the Ted Rogers School of Management at Ryerson University. And she is now running a game called a multimedia empire building game. She's been running it for several years, in which in the game you actually buy things as you achieve different goals in using multimedia, and you earn money from completing different quests that the assignment to instructor would give you. You use that to buy virtual bit coin in the course. It's not real Bitcoin. It's its own cryptocurrency. But you can use the coins to buy extensions on your essays or days off from class. So you can actually use the currency in her class to help assist with your learning. Really exciting. And uh, Professor Fells is getting for the first time in her teaching career over many years, decades at Ryerson, full five-star ratings in, what you, in, your, in your student feedback questionnaires, your SFQs, what they call CESAR ratings at Ryerson. So she's got the highest rating she's ever got as a prof, and she's been doing this a long time. By having Having her entire course turned into a game in which you're paid in experience points, not grades, and they're ultimately converted to a grade at the end of the course. We'll get back to that in a, in a little bit. And you can talk about this idea of business applications, of using various social credits, coupons, and having what's called locked content, which is material you can only access if you achieve other things in the game. What we're going to look at next time in our next little show is why would we use gamification? Is there any neurophysiological or social science or educational psychological evidence that supports the use of gamification? And fortunately, due to the many years that work uh, that has gone on at Simon Fraser University, the University Health Network, and uh, institutions as august as Harvard Medical School, we now have an accumulating body of evidence that gamification is not only engaging for students, but may do things that other educational tools toolkit elements cannot do. We'll talk to you next week. Join us again for section two of podcast on gamification and mixed reality. See you then.